Hello, um, Ilan. Hi, Frank. Good to see you. Good to, good to see you again. Um, we've been uh, we've been speaking. I mean, sort of every few months since uh, October seventh. I mean, we've been speaking every every few months since for, for about ten years. But I At guess uh, yes, yeah, that is true. <laughs> I guess uh, even more like in the last like seven months and um, absolutely I was I, I prepared this interview because I, I do prepare my interviews and um, I wanted to start by asking you about what happened about 10 days ago in the US in Detroit when you were interrogated uh, by uh, federal agents but in fact something happened a few hours ago that I maybe want to start with and what happened a few hours ago is that Hamas and its military wing launched a, a pretty massive rocket attack on uh, on Israel, um, Tel Aviv and a few other cities, which uh, I'd, I'd like you to, uh, what's your opinion on this? Because if we listen to Israel, they've been carpet bombing Gaza for seven months to eradicate Hamas. Um, if you listen to Israel, a lot of the casualties are Hamas fighters. If you listen to Israel, Hamas and, and you know the Al Qassam Brigade's military capacity has been really, really sort of damaged. But then Hamas shows that it looks like nothing of the of the sort happened. So what does it mean for the whole last seven months, in a way? Yeah, it has two sides to it because the. Uh, 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 the missiles were launched from Rafah. So on the one hand, Israel can concoct a, a, a narrative that says, you see, that's why we have to go into Rafah, the only place that we have not uh, occupied. And, and that's what they are already uh, saying. But you're right. It, it, there's something more profound here, and that is the military failure of Israel to defeat the Hamas uh, in terms of uh, its military capacity, its presence uh, in Gaza, it's obvious that they have not uh, fully understood until now how the Hamas is organized, structured, and so on, and their promises to the Israeli uh, society that this is a, a feasible uh, objective of the war, not only that, that this kind of uh, takeover of Gaza would be the uh, the main way of releasing the, the hostages. All this is crumbling down, definitely. So I think if if until now a lot of Israelis lost their confidence in the Israeli army because of what happened the seventh of October, I think there's another reason why they would be a bit less confident uh, uh, in the army and a lack of confidence in the army has, of course, more profound implications for uh, the sense of invincibility, uh, the vision, or the lack of horizon in the future, the vision uh, for the future. So definitely um, it is clear that uh, uh, we, we already knew that you cannot uproot the Hamas as a political force, an ideological force, whatever the Israeli will do. But it seems that they are also not able to really uproot it uh, militarily. Um, so uh, on the one hand, they will to cut short. On the one hand, they will use it to uh, ignore the ICJ ruling on Rafah. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in the deep, deep in the Israeli public, this would not be seen as a very good sign uh, and would, as I say, erode the, the confidence, uh, not only in the political leadership, but also in the military leadership. Thanks, Ilan. Um, obviously, I want to go back to the ICJ and the ICC, but you talked about the Israeli public. There is still this myth in Europe, or in like so-called liberal Europe, that um, the left exists in Israel and that there is a peace movement in Israel. We've seen lots of demonstrations in Israel in the past few months. Um, most of them call for the release of the hostages. Uh, a few of them call for the end of the war. But hardly, I mean, a, a very, very, very small group calls for, you know, the war being a genocide and for the end of the occupation, etc. Do you think there's a way that what's happened in the last seven months, including what's happened today with Hamas launching rockets, including many hostages still in Gaza 
uh, dying under you know Israeli bombing. Do you think there's a way that Israeli society or a, a, a part of Israeli society could finally see that this goes beyond, beyond the army or beyond Netanyahu being a bad guy? Or have you also lost hope in Israeli society? Well, it's a bit more complicated. I do think that the number of Israeli Jews who are willing to see the end of the war is much larger than it was two months ago. Uh, I still think the majority uh, uh, would feel that if, let's say, Netanyahu declares the end of the war, that it's a failure. And uh, uh, those who are his electoral base, those who are on the right, uh, really the electorate that brought this coalition to, to power in November 2022, uh, would, um, would still support very much uh, an intensified military action uh, uh, in Gaza. The other camp, the more liberal Israeli camp, we cannot call it the left, of course, anymore, and uh, it's more kind of center-right camp in Israeli political terms, I think becomes tired of the war, cannot see its uh, uh, its purpose anymore. It's still a minority, but it's a much larger minority than was before. It's interesting that the narrative that the families and those who support them and those who oppose Netanyahu have, the narrative is, let's have a swap of prisoners. Let's stop the war. Not, I haven't heard from anyone, let's stop the war because there's a genocide. Nobody says it in Israel. Let's, I mean, there are a few individuals who do, of course. Uh, and the Arabs of Israel say it. But, but you know, the, the, vast, the vast majority in the so-called liberal camp, they say, let's stop the war so that we can bring the hostages back home, and then we can continue the war. So I, I, I think that is what probably in Europe is so difficult to understand, that their reasoning for asking for a ceasefire is to bring back the hostages, which is fine, which is a, definitely a noble and justified a request, but uh, there is not even a modicum of compassion to the people of Gaza, which is really incredible if you think about it. So, um, yes, so, so, and they would like Netanyahu to go, that is true. Uh, but again, I think both of us know that even if Netanyahu goes, uh, Benny Gantz, Lapid, whoever will win who might probably win the next election, I think Netanyahu might lose it, will continue the military actions in the West, in the Gaza Strip, would not uh, let go, uh, f uh, would continue the harsh policy in the West Bank. Uh, they Their discourse would be more pleasant to European ears or American ears. Uh, but on the ground, I'm afraid that they have no plan B. They have no plan B, they have no strategy. And, and therefore, uh, position in Israel is to Netanyahu, to the idea that you cannot stop the war for hostage swap, but there's no opposition to punishing, if you want, in adverted commas, all the people of Gaza and using similar methods in the West Bank and suppressing any freedom of speech for the Palestinians inside Israel. There is a consensus political uh, point, uh, position in Israel about these three issues. When we spoke uh, about six months ago now, so sort of at the early stages of, of the genocide, you, you told me that what was happening in Gaza was an incremental genocide. You know, you said at the time, Israel's not going to go with the atomic bomb and erase Gaza. They could, but they're not. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the international community would have to say, no, no, this is not right. Uh, they will go incrementally. Um, you've been proven 100% right. But at the time, and seeing what's happened in the last six months, did you think Israel could go that far? Because we've seen some of the most horrific scenes and actions and bombardments and killings and and torture I have ever seen in my life. I'm, I'm 47 years old, you know. Did you expect that Israel and actually the international community, and I'm talking about states, would let this happen 
at this scale? Yeah, I, I was surprised by the level of brutality. I mean, I expected a very brutal uh, reaction after the 7th of October, but not not at that level. I didn't I didn't really expect it to be a genocide of that kind. And similarly, I didn't expect that uh, uh, a genocide that is daily broadcasted to us on our small screen, our bigger screen, which we cannot say that we don't know. Nobody can say that they don't know. It's, it's so visible in our in in, in our uh, screens, as I said. Um, I didn't think that Britain and the United States, in particular, could adopt such a callous uh, uh, position uh, and and g- continue to give to immunize Israel. I mean, <coughs> sorry, I understood. The early reactions, you know, two, three weeks after the 7th of October, uh, the kind of sympathy that European and American, European governments, United States showed to Israel because of what happened on the 7th of October. Uh, and I understood the discourse that they used of the right of self-defense. But that was before we understood what was going on in Gaza. The fact that this is still the, the discourse. Uh, is incredible, is incredible. And uh, uh, if, and we'll talk about it maybe, but if the international uh, tribunals, law, legal tribunals, will be able eventually to have a, a powerful position towards Israel, it will not stop with Israel. It will, I think, be also about those countries that were complicit either by military aid or by uh, their silence and, and uh, support. For these actions on the ground, I, I, I'm going to talk about this now. Uh, so, in the last few weeks, really, in the last few days, we've had the two highest judicial bodies in the world, uh, the International Criminal Court, uh, um, asking for an arrest warrant against uh, Galant and Netanyahu, which is hist- historical because usually they don't go after so-called you know, democracies or Western states, it's actually the first time they'll, I mean, there's Putin, but I guess he's not considered um, uh, part of the Western Western. world. Um, So this is historical, uh, despite the massive pressures that Karen Khan has been under and has been facing and the threats as well. You have the ICJ, the highest UN court, so the International Court of Justice, uh, asking Israel now to stop it's bombing of, of Gaza. You have Norway, Spain, and Ireland uh, recognizing Palestine, I think, on the 29th. So it's in about three days, which I, I think will bring the number of countries that recognize Palestine to about 146. So mm-hmm. a huge majority. And some others are coming. I think Slovenia is coming up as well. Uh, you have student occupations all over the world in the, the biggest universities in the world. You have more and more celebrities and people finally speaking out on, on, on Palestine and in support of, of Palestine. So, you know, I've, I've been immersed in the, in the Palestine question for nearly 20 years now. Um, I have never felt myself that Israel has been that, in a way, isolated. What, what's your view on that? Yes, I, I think you're right. This unprecedented level of isolation, there's no doubt. Uh, let, let's start with the ICJ and ICC. I think what happened, we have to remember, unlike domestic legal systems, international legal systems are more susceptible to political influence. And there are two kinds of political influence you get when you are dealing in an international tribunal with Palestine. You have pressure from the political elites that would like you to continue provide Israel an exceptional position and treat it as a Western country, and therefore the ICJ and ICC should not deal with Israel. It is, as you say, it's only for Russia and the global South. But you also have the pressure, and they are fully aware of it, of the global South and the civil societies in the global North that uh, demand that the government would take a tough uh, uh, action against uh, Israel. Uh, so they were also aware of it. 
And there is the gap, of course, between the politics from above and the politics from below in the global north uh, towards Israel. I think what the, the judges there felt that they can narrow the gap and not only reflect the political elite's wishes on Israel, but also reflect authentically what the uh, vast uh, uh, sections of the civil society around the world feels about Israel. And I think that's what they were doing. They, 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 I think for many years they waited for the political elites to do this. They didn't want to be the, those who initiated actions against Israel. And that's why even a prosecutor that Israel and America demanded would be appointed felt that he, he has to respond not just to the legal question, which of course he did, but also to the fact that they represent the global world. They don't represent uh, Western governments only. And, and so I think that's very important, despite, of course, many people would say there's some deficiencies in, they didn't mention genocide in the ICC and so on. Let's put all that aside. Basically, uh, it's, it's incredible compared to anything that happened before. And of course, it's not surprise that a country from the global south is the one that initiated uh, uh, the procedure. There's no way that even a pro relatively pro-Palestinian state would initiate such a, uh, such a process. So that's very, very important. Still, we have to see how it unfolds, what are the practical implications. They don't have much power of sanctions and so on. But nonetheless, I think historically, in the wider context, we will see it as a very important landmark uh, in the movement, I think, towards sanctions towards Israel, because we have already boycott and divestment. And the students, of course, uh, movement has helped to turn divestment into something far more widespread, uh, practical, and convince some of the university management to uh, take action on divestment. And that's also something that didn't happen uh, uh, before. Not only that, I think they led academics around the world for the first time who who already uh, were not very forthcoming towards their Israeli colleagues for the first time to tell why to tell the Israeli colleagues why they're not cooperating with this. And I think that has a lot to do with the students' uh, 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 movement. As for the recognition, I, I don't underestimate the importance of the recognition of Palestine. I think in this context, I mean, you know, if it happened two years ago, we would have said, yes, so what? They're the recognizing the PA. They're recognizing Area A in the PA. You know, the historical context is always very important. The context of where we are now suddenly makes this recognition something that we, we, we think is very significant, not because of the PA, not because the PA is suddenly recognized as a real government or, uh, or having a sovereign state, because the explanation that Spain, Norway, and Ireland gave is important that the Israeli actions in Gaza pushed them and others to have this kind of uh, uh, of idea. As you know, I don't support the two-state solution, so I'm not impressed by the fact that they connected to the two-state solution. But I think for many people in the world, the world Palestine in the recognition is not necessarily the geographical space that the PA con uh, controls or even a possible mini state if Israel would ever allow it in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. I think for many people it means after 76 years of denial, finally the government say the Palestine exists, the Palestinians exist, they are the victims, they are not the criminals, and they deserve justice, and they deserve to be heard, and we should hear what they want, and not all the time hear what the Israelis want. So I think there is, uh, this is also very important, not just about isolating Israel, it's for the first time that uh, two questions are being asked that haven't been asked before. Not is what is the future of the Palestinians, but rather what is the future of Israel. This is a question nobody asked. First time we're asking the question, what is the future of Israel? And secondly, for the first time, the Palestinians are asked about the vision for the future, and they're not asked to respond to an Israeli peace plan. So this, this is all very, very cardinal, very unprecedented, and time will tell how, how, how it affects realities on the ground, but I think it has a huge potential to do so. Thanks, Ilan. Finally, I want to go back to the question I'd, um, I wanted to ask you first. 
Um, so we see all these solidarity, uh, all its solidarity, you know, all over the world uh, that, you know, takes many forms. But what we've also, also seen, and this is why for me, this is a, a, mo a moment of incredible clarity. You know, you, you know, it's important to count each other at some point, you know, who is with us, who is yeah. against us. And the repression and the censorship that has happened on social media, in university, at a diplomatic level, is also mind blowing. I mean, when you see riot police going uh, to attack students in universities, in Switzerland, in France, in Belgium, in, in the US, uh, when you see, um, you know, very violent pro Israel mobs beating up peaceful pro Palestinians uh, with the police watching, the moment is, is, incredible, is incredibly clear. But in a way, repression and, and censorship takes many forms. And you have yourself, so you went, you went to the US about 10 days ago, mm -hmm. you flew, to, you flew mm -hmm. to Detroit, and, and I guess at, at your surprise, or maybe not, you were detained and interrogated for two hours by federal agents. Could you, and I know you've, you spoke about this quite a, uh, quite a lot on democracy now yeah. and, and things, but could you explain what happened again in a, uh, in a few, you know, yeah. in a few minutes? Yeah. And, and why do you think this happened? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I guess I, I I arrived in in the U in the US and immediately taken to uh, a, a, a small room on the side with two agents, which I should say were cordial, they were not abusive, but they refused to tell me why they stopped me. And they had kind of two rounds of question: one about my opinions on certain issues, such as the Hamas. Uh, the situation in Gaza, whether I think it's a genocide, and um, uh, also about the slogan, uh, Palestine should be free from uh, the river to the sea, uh, which I handled, I think, well, because uh, I'm a teacher and I really used it. You know, I sort of looked at them as students who don't know <coughs> anything. That, that was not so bad. I mean, it was not nice, but uh, uh, and, and and it was cheeky, and I I think, and uh, more I hear from my uh, uh, lawyers in in America it was also illegal in many ways. So we we're, we're still uh, pursuing it, and and we'll see what we'll do. They're not allowed apparently. I was too tired to know that they're not allowed to ask these questions. Uh, in fact, what the thing is that I could have said, and I want a lawyer. But then I would have stayed for nine hours in the airport, you know. So so these it's, there's no easy way out of it. But what was really troubling was the second uh, part of the of the of the discussion, so to speak, interrogation. One is that they asked for names of uh, Arabs and Muslims in America that I know, uh, asked me about several organizations, and that was very worrying for me. And then they took over my phone and copied everything in it, uh, which, again, I wasn't sure whether they have the right to do it or not. But again, I understood that if I refused, you know, I'm delaying. Uh, and I waited quite a while for them to return the phone. And then they said that I have to wait until they make several phone calls. I don't know who they called. Uh, and eventually they let me go. I think that um, whoever is behind it, I'm not sure these two agents took a decision by themselves, of course, came from high above is that the two things which are important, and that's why I publicized it, because I think it will help many of my uh, Arab-American friends who, who feel that uh, they are alone in these kinds of situation. And, and I hope that if we publicize these cases, uh, the federal agencies will be a bit more careful with what they're doing. Um, one, one is, I think, they have this narrative that professors of history or, uh, or senior non-academics, which is really false, are behind the student movements. So they come and uh, they are the ones who instigate these kinds of actions, which of course is ridiculous. The students did not need us to, to do what they did. Um, the second one is to deter you from coming back, you know, that you will think twice because... Uh, Whoever thought that you're coming to America is not good. Again, I, I, I don't have all the information. I must say, I don't know exactly if the Israelis pressured them or the pro-Israeli lobby, you know, uh, 
uh, I just finished a book, uh, Lobbying for Zionism on Two Sides of the Atlantic, and I realized that APAC sometimes acts as a state by its own. I mean, APAC can take an action like this without even consulting Israel. You know, they're, they're very powerful and they think themselves very powerful. So they don't consult on anything with Israel. So they could be behind it. The idea is to deter you. You'll think twice if every time you come to the States. This is less important. I think what is important to see it in the context, as you said rightly, it's part of the suppression. Uh, it's it's uh, part of the, this is the what happened to the rector of Glasgow University, Rasana Busita, who was denied uh, entry to Germany and France. Uh, this is uh, happening to a lot of other uh, people who speak openly and courageously uh, on Palestine, and especially they're targeting the people who are known to show that they can reach everyone. I mean, uh, it's easy, of course, to target students and so on. Uh, and I think that's where they will fail, because people like us, uh, I'm not saying we're immune. We're not immune from anything, and anything can happen to us. I'm fully aware of it. But I think that uh, they are uh, uh, they are lost with ideas of what to do. Uh, instead of, as I told these agents, I said to them, you know, just watch what's happening in Gaza and you stop asking these questions. Maybe you don't know what's going on there. I said, forget Hamas, forget uh, what What do you care if I'm for one state or two states? Who cares? Why, why do you care you are in Detroit? But don't ask why people are doing what they're doing, for God's sake, you know? Um, and, and I think it, they were a bit embarrassed by my, my response to this. Uh, as I say, it's not their decision, you know, that they had to to do this. But I think, yeah, it, it is worrying because I kept saying to them, you don't stop professor of history for two hours for coming to give three lectures on history. I said, you lost your mind doing this. Uh, and uh, and I think that's what, that is why I exposed it, as you're right. I think you're right. It's a, a general suppression. Uh, the ordeal was not terrible, but uh, it it is uh shows that they have no limits uh, when it comes to Israel. And uh, this is important, given what's going on on the ground. Um, so as much as the solidarity movement has swelled and increased, the counter movement is now taking off its gloves and will do all it can to kill the messengers because they cannot change the message. So. Uh, if killing the messages is stopping me for two hours in Detroit, it's not too bad, but I'm afraid they can do, not necessarily to me, but they can do, and they've already done worse things mm. to, to, to people in order to stop them. But the, it will not work. As you know, Frank, it will not work. None of us will stop saying what we are saying. None of us will stop writing what we are writing. Uh, we, know, we feel we are on the right side of history, and we'll do all we can to help the Palestinian in the struggle for liberation and freedom thanks Ilan no no better way to to end um and yes we will uh we will not stop until it ends um and um I think you know being and knowing that you're on the right side of history uh, is a very powerful um powerful um impulse you know and uh so yeah thank you Ilan Thank you, Frank. It was always great talking to you. Thanks. I hope to Same. see you soon. Okay. Same. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.